Okay, welcome everyone. We're just going to give everyone a, a minute for the attendees to start joining us. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Youth Career Pathways um, Conference TA session um, on workers' rights. That's today's topic and work youth, or youth workers' rights. Um, my name is Kirsten Bayer with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar um, and technical assistance. So if you need any assistance, please reach out to me through the chat. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started this morning. As a reminder, all participants on this call are in listen only mode and they cannot unmute themselves. But if you have questions as the webinar proceeds, please post those in the chat or the Q&A. And we will, we will facilitate those at the end of the session during a live Q&A um, with our presenters today. And then a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and today's slides and recording will be up on Illinois WorkNet. I will put that website um, in the chat for your easy access. You can download the slides um, right now and then the recording will be up within 48 hours of the live session. And then um, in an effort to be as accessible as possible, if you do feel like you need closed captioning capabil capabilities, you can access those on the recorded version on the YouTube. And then just a reminder, if you have faulty internet connection today or would prefer to call in, please do so using the phone number in your original registration email. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to our presenter today, Allison Dixon. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um... I'm assuming there's people out there. We can't, can't see anything, but um, it's nice to be here. Um, my name is Allison Dixon. I am a senior instructor at the School of Labor and Employment Relations at the University of Illinois. And I am joined here with a colleague, Ashley Hamilton. Um, Ashley, do you wanna just say hi? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Ashley Hamilton and I'm the program manager for the Frontline Focus Training Institute at the Chicago Jobs Council. So today we're going to talk about worker rights and young workers, um, and particularly during this time period of a pandemic and um, potentially unsafe working conditions um, for essential workers. This is only an hour, and that is, um, I think, more than anything, I'm thinking of this as a, a bit of a teaser for um, hopefully some other webinars folks will participate in. And we have some upcoming ones. There's one, um, I believe on May, March 24th, um, and I'm sure folks will get information about that. And that will be a longer, um, I think, three hour session or two hour session. Longer than this one, because um, like I said, an hour is not really enough to, <laughs> to cover everything, but hopefully we can, we can just get our feet wet a little bit. And then um, here you see my email. So if folks have any questions or issues or anything else, I'm happy to, um, to help you through those. So. So just to kind of give you a sense of what we're going to go over, and if Ashley, you can just like um, keep me on track with time. I'm like going to try my hardest to look at, make sure I do. But um, I'm going to make sure that folks get sent um, access to a Google Drive resource folder of um, different um, handouts and um, just different really good accessible material that I've been collecting that's all very current um, that has to do with this topic and so um, you all should get um, access to that and then what we're going to do um, in the remaining time is you know basically talk about why worker rights is important um, as part of any comprehensive job training program um, we're going to do a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one preview and then talk about ways to protect yourselves and then um, kind of some next steps so as you're writing down today, I would just say um, it's it's been helpful. I've I've found you know for us like doing these zooms for the last year that it's often um, good if when I'm doing participating in a webinar, I write down um, a quotation. Um, 
something that's been said that stands out, and, you know, certainly obviously any questions, um, but then also talking points, things you might want to bring up with a colleague later. I think that the topic we're talk we're discussing today is um, something that is extremely important, but isn't often discussed in the world of workforce development. So hopefully this will bring up um, some talking points and ideas for, for further discussion. And like I said, you all will be getting sent um, a link to this resource folder. So why teach worker rights? Um, well, across the nation, we have this epidemic of wage theft. And wage theft, um, for folks who don't know, is, is basically all the different illegal ways that employers um, shortchange steal from their workers. And so that happens when people are not paid for all the hours they work. It's when they um, aren't paid the legal minimum wage or they're paid just straight time for overtime. Um, they have illegal deductions from their checks. There's lots of different ways wage theft occurs. Um, I was able to work on a research study um, now it's 12 years ago and um, we were able to measure wage theft in the three largest um, cities in the nations. So we did it in New York, LA, and Chicago. And so 12 year, years ago, we were able to measure that just in Cook County, $7.3 million was being stolen from workers, low wage workers every single week um, on, by their employers. And that was 12 years ago. So with inflation, that that figure is much larger. And so when we're talking about an epidemic, I don't use that word lightly. Um, this is, you know, serious amounts of money um, that, that that's being stolen from folks. Um, also that, you know, when, when you think about just like the myriad of laws that protect workers, um, it's, it's often very navigate, uh, difficult to navigate this um, environment. This is not information we learn typically at school. Um, most employers don't feel the need to sit down their workers for a worker rights class. Um, normally folks, you know, just learn about things when they have a problem or maybe they read the, the posters in the break room, but that's about it. And then, and especially in a state like Illinois where um, our local governments are empowered under the state constitution to set stronger um, baseline laws than what the state or federal government require, we have, um, some stronger protections for workers in Chicago, in Cook County. Um, even in Illinois, we have stronger protections than folks in other states. And so um, I, I've had the experience of like teaching in, on like the Southeast side of Chicago um, and having folks, workers in my classroom um, that were covered under like four different minimum wages um, because of just the geography of that area. So we had Indiana, Calumet City, Chicago. Um, so it gets really confusing. And if it's confusing for me and I'm uh, a faculty member <laughs> teaching employment law, it's, it's certainly gonna be confusing for most of the folks that we work with. So why connect with workforce development? I think that, you know, we really have, I've assumed the, 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 the mantra that part of being job ready is knowing your rights as a worker. And if you're already including a component on financial literacy, I think that it makes a lot of sense to also be talking about protecting against wage theft. Um, and, you know, because obviously um, this will help um, workers earn more money and better support their families. And, and I think it just makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, I've been connecting with workforce development agencies in this capacity for the last nine years or so, 10 years. And it's been my experience, um, accountants number of times talking to frontline staff of agencies that they often feel very frustrated, um, knowing that they are potentially placing folks, the workers that they're serving with, um, you know, shady, disreputable employers, or that maybe these workers come back to them and complain about different situations of discrimination or have questions about their rights and that these frontline staff don't feel equipped at all to answer them or even really guide them in the direction of where they should go for help. And so I think that this is just, it's, it's a natural partnership. So, you know, I say all this and because we, we, we've done a lot of work in this area, we've developed um, first in 
the nation curriculum completely devoted to how to incorporate worker rights into workforce development context. You can download this, the third edition, for free. Um, here's a link. I can send that out too. It's through Chicago Job Council's website, the Frontline Focus um, Training Institute, the tools section, um, and you can get a, a whole copy of the of the curriculum there to download. The curriculum, just to give you a really quick overview, um, it covers um, kind of the gambit of employment and labor laws. Um, and each of the units is set up um, with pick and choose modules. So, you know, recognizing that folks who, um, you know, are working at one-stop centers or like, you know, um, are, are doing any sort of um, job readiness training, probably don't have a lot of extra time to take on a whole brand new curriculum. Um, each of these activities is kind of is set up to be five to 20 minutes long and is something that hopefully can be added on to to um, you know discussions that you're already having um, in the classroom setting so when you think about different ways to connect worker rights to existing job training programs um, I know here's just a few examples of ways that it works well like if you if you're practicing interviewing skills um, we have activities in the curriculum that um, help folks recognize illegal discrimination in hiring and kind of what the red flags are. Um, if you're doing some, you know, communication stuff, there's there's uh, role play activities on talking with supervisors or coworkers about problems on the job, um, and and just kind of recognizing that folks have different levels of literacy um, and, and also English language comprehension, um, the, the activities are organized kind of like with, with different learning um, and teaching methods and, and um, really, you know, some of them are, are just rely on videos or looking at pictures. And so I think it's pretty accessible to a, a pretty wide audience. So here's an example of like an activity where you could be practicing some sort of remedial math, um, but also um, identifying potential wage theft on a paycheck stub. Um, and so you could be, you know, checking to make sure that there's no illegal, illegal deductions or that overtime was calculated correctly. Um, so what's wrong here? I think, oh, I think because they got paid straight time for 96 hours. So that would be a violation of overtime laws. All right. So um, with that, I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit of a, a teaser of, of what kinds of things we normally talk about in our classes. Um, and so uh, I guess I'm going to be, <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought I'd be able to ask folks questions and talk back and forth, but it's okay. I can talk to uh, Ashley. <laughs> um, so for these scenarios, um, I want everybody um, in your, in wherever you're viewing this to kind of to, to read these um, and assume that the workers in each scenario uh, work in Illinois are at least 16 years old and are non-union. So they're at will employees. Okay. And the reason why um, these three things are important for our, um, um, for what we're doing here today is because if these workers were to be working in Indiana or Wisconsin, there'd be very different laws. Um, I know that the focus today is on young workers, um, but my understanding is that we were looking at workers that were like ages 16 to 24. And so um, I'm gonna be talking about some occupations that are pretty prevalent for that age group. Under 16, child labor laws kick in. And so um, it would be a whole nother set of um, rules um, regulating hours, um, times a day you can work. I did not include this in this presentation. I'm pretty sure I included it in the worker rights folder that I'm going to share with folks, but um, I'll double check that. But just to let you know that if, if in any of these situations, if somebody was under 16, it would be a, a different set of laws. Um, also, the, the other thing I put is that they're non-union. So um, in Illinois, about 15% of workers are unionized, um, which, you know, at a very simplistic level means that they're all protected under 
are, are for the most part, they're protected under collective bargaining agreements, which are legally binding contracts. And so they are not at will employees. So for instance, I'm protected by a union. Um, if my employer wanted to get rid of me, they would have to go through a series of kind of progressive discipline that's outlined in the contract in order to fire me. They couldn't just get rid of me from one day to the next. That is not the case for 85% of Illinois workers. So um, this is just kind of, you know, the pretty typical story of things I hear from folks that I'm teaching, um, but I, I made it up. Um, I mean, I changed names and employers, obviously. So Jeremy waits tables at an Olive Italiano restaurant in Peoria. His shift starts at 11 a.m., but his manager insists he arrive by 10.45 a.m. so that his station is ready for the lunch service. Is Olive Garden required to pay Jeremy for this extra 15 minutes? And so this would be um, when I pose questions like this, um, when I'm teaching the workers directly or when people are using this kind of activity from the curriculum. Um, it's oftentimes really engaging. I have a whole series of different questions in the curriculum uh, because most folks um, have worked in these kind of jobs before or know somebody who has worked in these kind of jobs. And it has been my experience teaching thousands of workers directly that um, people perk up and they wanna talk about this stuff and they wanna share their stories and it's pretty cathartic sometimes to be able to talk about these things because nobody ever does. Um, and, you know, I, I never, um, I cease to be amazed sometimes hearing stories um, where something that might seem like the slightest infraction is, is the thing that really gets people riled up. And I think, you know, so much of it has is tied up in dignity and respect and all sorts of other things. And, you know, we're not going to get into all that, but I think that these kind of questions that seem very similar um, to people um, or relatable um, are, are, are very engaging. All right. I'm assuming people can't answer through the chat. I'm just going to talk people through. People can't answer through the chat, Allison. They can respond to anything you ask them in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Why don't I'll have people answer the next one since I've like already. <laughs> we did a poll for these, remember? Oh, oh, I forgot. We did set up a poll. Thank you. you want me to launch those? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Kirsten. So the poll is asking on this slide, is Olive Garden required to pay Jeremy for this extra 15 minutes? Okay, and I just shared the results. So um, our attendees have said yes. Oops. Yes. Yes. So here, um, I mean, I this was kind of an easy warm up since we just were talking about this, but this would be wage stuff. This is off the clock work. Um, but I think that uh, this when it happens in these little 15 minute or 10 minute segments, oftentimes people, even if they know it's not right, they're just like, ah, it's only 10 minutes. Ugh, it's only 15 minutes, whatever, you know, like, but there, you could imagine a lot of different circumstances where there's an expectation that like, you know, you're ready to go and your, your station is all set up. You're, um, you know, to, to be there at a, at a certain time. In this case, it was 11 a.m., but, um, you know, for an hourly worker, they need to be paid that time. And while it's only 15 minutes over the course of a week, a month, that adds up and that's wage theft. Um, and so these, when I'm using these, these kind of, um, these scenarios to talk about these issues with workers, the most important thing to, that I, I want them to, to take away is that it's really on them to document all these issues. And so rather than even focusing on the specifics of the laws that are being violated and how much minimum wage is supposed to be, um, we talk about kind of strategies for protecting yourself. Uh, so here I put together um, a list of 
of different types of wage theft. I'm sure there are ones here that like, there are other ones I didn't even think about that, um, I'll see if there's any I didn't mention yet. Uh, stealing workers tips. So um, at a place that like, uh, a restaurant where folks are getting tips, it's legal, it's okay to, to require employees tip out bussers or bartenders, but it's not legal to make them um, give a cut to management or anything like that. Um, so also um, training, training is something that needs to be paid for, um, closing a business without final check, all these things um, that actually is going on with a good friend of mine. I need to <laughs> realize something I need to follow up on today. Um, so when you think about who's especially at risk for wage theft, it's the exact folks that we're most concerned with. And young workers, I think just for, you know, the very fact that they're inexperienced um, and these are gonna be some of their first jobs are, are gonna be very at risk for wage theft. And so in the studies where we've measured the prevalence of wage theft, um, what we've noticed is that while it occurs, um, kind of across the board to, to a huge proportion of workers, that the folks who, are, who certainly have the highest rates of violations are the folks that I think not, we would expect, right? Um, the workers who are in most vulnerable situ situations. So immigrant workers, returning citizens, like in, just in general, people of color, um, working mothers. Um, and then there are certain industries that maintain a culture of wage theft. So from a study I, I conducted in 2012 on car washes, I know that, well, at least at that time, we surveyed workers at like two thirds of the car washes in Chicago that um, like you know, the vast majority, like 95% of them were guilty of wage theft. I mean, it was like ridiculous. So there's certain, there's certain industries that maintain this culture. And you know when I'm I, I, I'm um, probably it looks like very <laughs> singularly obsessed with this wage theft thing, but when we kind of when, when there's been studies done that compare wage theft um, on a national level, um, and so this is just an interesting infographic that was put out by the Economic Policy Institute that compares um, the amount reported in stolen robberies nationally to wage theft, and this is just. Um, you know, reported violations of wage theft, which is a drop in the bucket, because um, we know that most workers don't file complaints. And so you can see that wage theft is really, really a huge problem um, facing all of us. So for Jeremy, um, you know, the, the, the most important thing that I think um, that he needs to be doing is um, just constantly keeping track of all his hours. So, um, you know, that's beyond just having a copy of the schedule that they give him or taking a picture um, of that, that schedule, it means that like on his own, either in his phone or on a paper calendar, writing down that his shift started at 11, but they wanted him there at 1045. So he didn't clock into 11, but he was there at 1045. He needs to be keeping good track of that. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a lot of companies now I know um, have their, shift calendars um, through their own apps and things, that's not sufficient. He needs to do it on his own with his own system um, because at any time, you know, especially if he's raising concerns about um, potential, you know, wage theft or other violations, they can cut him off of that system or, you know, they can also go back and manipulate and change things. And I say all this and I, I perhaps they come across as like a conspiracy theorist, but um, all this stuff happens every single day. Um, he also needs to be keeping track of just his check stubs because the Department of Labor or wherever he goes to, to, to deal with this issue is going to want to see kind of a record of what's been happening. Um, I think he should be, you know, also just kind of keeping a, a journal of the tips he received. Um, Collecting coworker info. Um, this is, you know, one of the most um, important ways to protect yourself, um, and and successful ways of kind of winning these complaints is if one or more, or two or more workers um, file a complaint together. So, oftentimes, I would imagine if this is happening to Jeremy, it's happening to some of the other servers. If they file a complaint together, it's gonna um, 
have a lot higher um, chance of success. Let's move on to the next one. And we'll do a poll for this one, guys. All right. So a global pandemic plus polar vortex. I think I wrote this like two weeks ago and it was terrible. Oh. <laughs> um, a global pandemic plus polar vortex mean that most of all of Italiano's business has switched to takeout orders. Jeremy no longer has tables to wait and is helping package customer orders. Before the pandemic, Jeremy was paid a tip sub minimum wage in addition to his tips. Can his employer continue doing this now? Yes or no? Okay, so our attendees have said no. I put depends. It probably is no. Um, it really has to do with how much, if, if with these takeout orders, he's also getting tips, enough tips that it's it's making up the difference. And somehow that but between that sub minimum wage and the legal minimum wage, where did I say he was working, Peoria? Um, if it equals like what the minimum wage would be for everybody else. so. I know that like with takeout orders, when I get takeout now, I like always tip well because I'm thinking about <laughs> I'm thinking about poor Jeremy here, right? Um, so um, when we think about the map of minimum wages, this is something that's in the news obviously right now, right? With the Biden administration trying to raise the federal minimum wage as part of the budget reconciliation process. Um, but at the moment, the federal minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour, and that sets the floor. Um, but like I said, in Illinois, under our state constitution, um, different um, local governments can set higher wages. Um, but it's important to know that there's these sub-minimum wages still, okay? And so for folks under 18, including a lot of the people you probably serve, um, tip workers and some workers with disabilities, you can pay a sub minimum wage. And if you ever wanna like really get into the weeds, um, if this is, I, I think with certain groups, um, especially when I've taught um, some classes that were like part of GED completion classes, um, ones where they were still like exploring US history and things, um, it's really interesting to spend a few minutes kind of going into the history of why it is that we have sub-minimum wages in this country. Um, so um, the, the, just the, the 32nd version is that when the first federal minimum wages were passed in the 1930s under Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, as part of the New Deal, um, in order to get support from Southern senators um, to pass that legislation, um, Roosevelt's administration had to agree to have some certain carve outs. And so there were whole groups of workers that were excluded from those um, first federal labor laws. And um, so one group, of the, one group of workers that was ex excluded were agricultural workers. Um, and another group were domestic workers. And so if you think about who was working agricultural and domestic jobs in the South in the 1930s, right? I mean, it was clearly very um, kind of racist intentions um, um, in, with those exclusions um, from, the, from the laws. But another group that was like partially excluded were tip workers. And so they made these sub minimum wages um, basically because they wanted to make sure that folks like porters and bellhops um, still still knew their place, right? That they still like, that they knew that they had to, to act a certain way and be deferential in order to get tips. And now 80 years later, um, these racist laws are still in, in play. Um, and it, there are some states that have, have eliminated the sub-minimum wage, um, recognizing that um, tips have very little to do with the service somebody um, 
provides, you know, when they're, when they're serving, um, it really has there's a lot more things in play, such as discrimination and sexual harassment. And so that's just another, you know, that's a tangent and there's, and there are efforts in Illinois to pass um, what's called the one fair wage law, which would mean that there would be no more tip wage that workers would get a flat minimum wage than plus tips. Um, but for this point, at this point, workers like Jeremy can still get this tip minimum wage. And so here it's just a very, quick cheat sheet of the confusion that I'm talking about with, with minimum wages. So we see here um, in Chicago currently $14 an hour um, for youth workers. So that's under 18, um, $10 an hour. Cook County, it's $13 an hour, but there are a lot of municipalities, the vast majority of municipalities in Cook County that opted out of that minimum wage increase. And so I live in Evanston and Evanston, we have the higher minimum wage 13. Um, but if you go 10 minutes to the south to Lincolnwood, um, they are at $11 an hour, which is what the rest of the state of Illinois is. But then you look, you know, all the states surrounding us, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, and um, I don't know where folks on this call are calling in from, but it's been my experience like teaching in Rockford and Moline and places around the state that are on the border that there's a lot of crossover and um, employers take advantage of the confusion. So just, it's important, I think for everybody on this call, just to stay abreast of what's going on um, with the minimum wage increases. So for Jeremy here, once again, just kind of thinking about some documenting strategies. Um, you know, he wants to be keeping track of his hours, his stubs, uh, the, the same sort of thing, tips, um, contact info. And this is, you know, I mean, if, if we're gonna be real about it, and this is, these are conversations I have all the time with my students, um, there, I think a lot of times servers and tip workers are less likely to, um, to, to uh, file wage complaints because they're concerned really about um, having to report their tips, right? A lot of tips are paid oftentimes under the table. So if you're not paying taxes on it, um, you know, you're saving money in another way. Um, but then if you file a wage theft complaint, you are gonna have to report your taxes. And so these are all just like, you know, I, I'd be the last person to ever tell somebody that they have to file a complaint with the government, right? Um, but I think it's important um, as we're teaching folks how to navigate these situations that they just are kind of aware of all these issues and that they then make the choice an informed decision about what they should be doing. And so here we're gonna move to discrimination real quick. Um, so Brianna is seven months pregnant and works as a cashier at Dollar Commander in Kankakee. Her OBGYN says she cannot be on her feet for an eight hour shift. Can she be fired for not being able to stand and operate her cash register? Right, so the answer is no, because this is illegal. Discrimination. Ah, sorry. Um, let me just go back here. So, when I present on discrimination, um, typically I, I present a situation like this that is, you know, pretty black and white. Um, I think. Most folks know that um, pregnancy is one of the protected, um, pregnant women are one of the protected classes, right? They need to be accommodated. Um, if they can do their jobs with accommodation, rather like folks um, who are working with disabilities that they, they should not be, it's illegal to discriminate against them. Um, in reality, know that we know though that discrimination, whether it be against pregnant people or um, folks with disabilities or based on race or ethnicity or any other form of discrimination, it's generally more subtle than that, right? Um, employers are not 
so stupid that they're gonna, you know, say I'm firing you because you're pregnant. I'm firing you because I don't like black people or I don't like gay people, right? Um, so they find some pretense, right? And so I'll take a situation like this and I'll say, okay, well, let's say we know that Brianna is seven months pregnant um, and um, she's asked for accommodations and, you know, begrudgingly they give her the accommodations, but, um, you know, she, uh, she just, you know, feels like she's being treated differently. And then one day she comes back 10 minutes late from lunch and her manager fires her. Um, is this illegal? Well, the answer, I mean, it, it's, it, it really, you, this is, this is, it depends, but I would say that likely, yes, that even though um, we know Brianna is an at-will employee, that she can be fired um, at any time for pretty much any reason, unless it's a legal reason. Um, so being fired for returning um, to lunch from lunch break late is, is a legal reason to fire somebody. Um, that on service is not illegal, but if the underlying reason um, is because of her pregnancy, then it is illegal. And so most employers, if they're gonna discriminate, they use a pretense. And so how would Brianna possibly prove that? Well, she would, um, um, you know, if she's already sensing that she's being, that they're treating her differently, she needs to be journaling all those situations, right? Um, she needs to be writing down on Monday morning at 9 a.m. My manager, um, Sarah, came up to me and said this. And then later in the day, um, she was like, making fun of me of how big I'm getting or something. I don't know, like, you know, just kind of every single time that there's some sort of slight or something that Brianna senses is discriminatory, she needs to write it down, all the who, what, where, when, why, right? Um, and keeping a log of incidents like that is how one establishes the case of illegal discrimination. Um, so that would be one way. Another way, um, would be to possibly see if there are other coworkers um, that she has that have also been um, returned late from lunch, but they weren't fired. Well, what's the difference between them and her? They're not pregnant, okay? So then she's being treated differently and there's disparate treatment that makes it illegal, right? Um, and so these kind of situations happen all the time with every kind of discrimination you can imagine. And so um, this is where I think it's so important for the folks that we serve to just be incredibly diligent about keeping notes. And um, I've seen successful job training programs um, that have given their students like journals um, with prompting questions, the, the who, what, where, why, um, that they have as is as, as kind of like one of their assignments um, that they have folks fill out every single day just to keep track of incidents or just issues that they're having in the job training program or things that they like or don't like or I don't know like just kind of getting into the habit of writing down stuff because you know somebody's chicken scratch in a journal as long as it's got dates and times and who the players were that are involved that's going to count that that satisfies in any court, right? So these are the things that Brianna needs to be doing. And so um, I would, yeah, I would say clearly she, she, you know, the incident I, I um, posed would be illegal. Um, she needs to be accommodated by having her registered lowered, um, by giving her a chair. Um, they could have her, um, you know, kind of rotating um, positions so that she sometimes has a position where she gets to sit down. Um, most jobs, there should be um, some, some way to accommodate her. I think even in like a lot of manufacturing and construction, there are ways to accommodate people. Um, if legit they can't, then they could lay her off. Um, I don't think we have time. Um, this is um, 
I'm gonna show a quick video um, because I think it's really good for getting folks to think about um, pretense um, and it's only about four or five minutes, um, but it just kind of all the different ways that employers um, illegally discriminate against people. Let's see if that works. True Confessions continues. Now, Deborah Roberts with Confessions from the Corner Office. You guys can hear that, so right? Why don't you uh, describe yourself, Mr. Dupree? Yes, we can hear it. Of course, if you're looking for a Clyde sale, I'm probably not your, your man. Um, incidentally, what's your policy on Columbus Day? Yeah, we, we work. Really? Between you, me, and Dupree, most of us know the wrong things to say in a job interview. My resume. <laughs> But in her book, Corporate Confidential, former company hatchet woman Cynthia Shapiro reveals that what you don't know could not only prevent you from getting hired, but could get you fired. You are essentially giving all those dirty little secrets that HR does not want us to know. They're definitely dirty. They're not always so little. <laughs> and they can be sneaky. If you see those on the interviewer's desk and start bonding over having kids, you may have fallen into a secret trap. There's a, an HR director that I know, and when you come in for the interview, she's got a picture of two adorable little kids that are facing you in the interview. She doesn't have kids. This is a trick. What she has is an edict from upper management to not hire moms. So if you start talking about your children, she yes. knows right away to strike you off the list. Exactly right. That's and terrible. And you'll never know. And there's even a secret backup plan that might keep moms from getting hired. The let me walk you back to your car trick. They're looking to see if you have a baby seat in the back. Aha, uh -huh. so they come Most over here and they- these people do. And that could cost you the job. That will cost you the job. But even if you land the job, Shapiro says prepare for a game of survival where only your boss knows the rules. Violate them and you may end up on the dreaded top secret layoff list. There really are layoff lists. Yes, There's there lists are secret. Are yes, <laughs> there are secret layoff vulnerable. lists. She confesses that all kinds of things can get you on the layoff list, including, get this, your vacation plans. Hiker asked how much vacation time you get in the first year. Vacation time? Want vacation time? Go teach third grade public school. But if you don't work in a boiler room like the guys in this film, and you actually get two weeks of vacation, Shapiro says no one tells you that you probably shouldn't take them all at once. Companies move too fast. They'll find a way around you in two or three weeks and they'll realize they can do without you and they will. And watch out for those Mai Tais and margaritas on your not longer than one week vacation. Yeah, we gotta trim some of the fat around here. Trim, the, what do you mean by trim the fat? I want you to fire the fat people. Like in the movie, there are horrible bosses, Shapiro says, who put you on that layoff list simply for how you look, especially if you're looking too old. Only executives get to have gray hair. It's not fair, but that's how it goes. You want to look good, but not too good. Deborah Lee Lorenzano claims she was fired by Citibank because they thought her sexy looks were too distracting, even though she wore business clothes. The worst feeling was knowing that HR was not there to help me, but to help Citibank. Citibank insists Lorenzana was let go for poor job performance. Oh, what's under that jacket? You're pregnant, have been for a while. So unfortunately didn't tell us because uh, you would have found out that we thought it's great. <laughs> really? And believe it or not, Shapiro says being pregnant isn't always celebrated, as in this scene, even though there are laws to protect women from being fired. That's what people like me were paid, you know, big bucks to do, to find the gray areas around the laws that would allow the companies to do what they want to do. Which is what 25-year-old Tess Adams says happened to her. She'd recently had a stellar performance evaluation when she was suddenly fired for cause. Her bosses said she was a poor employee. Why do you think you were fired? I think I was fired because I was pregnant. Do you think that maybe it was related to your work? There's no way. No way. I never had a complaint until I told him I was pregnant. In fact, Shapiro says the dirtiest secret of all is that companies rarely tell employees the real reason they wound up on the layoff list for fear of being sued for wrongful termination. 
We're going to need to go ahead and move you downstairs into storage B. No, I, we, uh, I'm just going to have some to. new people. People coming in. They... If your office space changes for the worst, like in this film, maybe you're being managed out. A clever way companies get rid of unwanted employees, along with dead end projects. It's all about building a paper trail, proving you're a poor worker. The HR people are going to kill me for disclosing this on TV, but um, they will create documentation that makes the employee look like they're not doing their job. They fake documentation. Uh, they create it. They, it's all, it's all um, how you look at it, right? Shapiro says she was fed up with all that deception, so she quit her high-paying HR job and became a whistleblower. Today, she's on the other side of the fence. Is there an area the company is guiding you towards? Using her insider... Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. Try again. Um... So I like that video. Um, even I will show it um, with, I lost my PowerPoint, <laughs> uh, with, with uh, folks that are preparing for jobs, like not in offices and stuff, because I think that the lessons are, they resonate well. Um, you know, most people uh, can see how different ways that employers would use pretense to legally discriminate against them. Um, you know, one thing that's in the news right now, because um, it's, it's what I always find exciting um, is that these issues, I mean, they are in the news every single day. Um, the, there's a huge class action lawsuit going on right now with um, temp workers that work um, in some of the, the warehouses, like the Amazon warehouses and all those distribution centers in Will County um, for illegal discrimination. Um, so there's kind of just been, a, as, as attorneys would say, a pattern and practice of um, discrimination and hiring where um, the temp agencies have a preference for Latinos and just generally immigrants as opposed to um, the black workers. And I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to pose problems like that and, and situations like that to, to students and kind of you know, get a good discussion about going on. Like why would a temp agency do that? Why would, they, why would their most preferential hire be an immigrant worker? Um, and then, you know, I even have um, tools that I use, like uh, this leaked memo um, from one temp agency that showed an actual list of the demographics, the top 10 that were preferred. So the first one being undocumented young female. Um, and so using um, something like that, that is, you know, was a, it's, it's, it's uh, it's not something I made up. This is something that came from a, a temp agency on 26th Street in Chicago. Um, why, and just kind of getting a good discussion, real discussion going on about why is the undocumented um, young female um, the most preferential hire? Um, and then, you know, you get down to number three on the list and it was um, ex-offender female. Um, and so then really just talking about how these companies take advantage and how they're looking to exploit. And the reason why those are their most preferential hires is literally because they think that those are the people that have the greatest chance of, um, you know, that, that aren't gonna speak up because they're people who don't have a lot of other options of where they can work and being especially younger females, um, chances are they have, um, kids at home that, they, that, that they're taking care of. And so they need to bring home money so they can feed them, right? And so it's really, you know, um, uh, I think that like in keeping abreast of these stories and using them, um, the headlines to get discussions going, um, these are issues that most people wanna talk about um, because they, they know too well what these abuses are like and they've never even had an opportunity to discuss them. Nobody's ever asked them how it made them feel, what happened. Um, and so um, 
that is is more or less what I have. Um, this is for for Brianna the kind of the things that she she should be doing. Um, you know, the only other thing I was I have on here that would be important for Brianna, I think um, it's important for um, her to just keep copies of anything that's in her personnel files. Um, we all in Illinois have the right to review our personnel files twice a year and make copies of things in it. Um, if all of a sudden she's being fired and she has like an exemplary track record, like the woman who was pregnant in the video, um, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It looks like there was probably some other underlying reason why she was fired. And in that case, it was illegal discrimination. So these are all these things are different ways. And so, um, you know, one of the most, I think, uh, uh, illuminating examples I often use is, is one that has to do with um, misclassification when a worker um, who's an employee is being called an independent contractor and all the different myriad of issues that that entails for the worker. Um, but in, in this incidence, um, the worker, their strategy was taking a photo of um, the contractors, the employer's license plate number and using that to enforce their rights. Um, and so there's lots of different ways and, and the curriculum helps folks kind of navigate this and just really think outside the box of dif different ways to be a detective and to protect themselves. And um, I really hope that everybody on the call gets a chance to look at it and I will be sending around that um, resource folder. So um, I guess let's, why don't we uh, open it up for any questions and I will stop my share. All right, I think I stopped the share off. Um, you did. Okay, is there anything else? Um, Allison, um, it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I did wanna reiterate, if you did have any questions, please feel free to post those in the chat or the Q&A. Um, this session is recorded and you can find the, the session recording and the slides from today at the website that I posted within the chat. Um, and with that, we don't have anything else for this session. Allison or Ashley or Tara, did you have any final thoughts before we close out today? I'm just gonna ask Allison, is there like a chart that shows you the wages throughout the state of Illinois that we could send out to folks? Does that even exist? Um, so I think the best, um, the most current document would, would actually be just that slide that I had in the presentation. Um, okay. There isn't, to the best of my knowledge, um, no agency um, in Illinois has compiled all the wages together. And so that's why I did that. Um, so if you wanna just like copy and paste that or like, you know, whatever, just copy that slide. I think that that would work. Um, okay. Because that's the one that's most up to date. It'll change again in July. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's these grants start. So that's why I was okay. So we'll, we'll hold off until these grants start in July. So that's fun time for them to. So they're doing the proposals now. Okay. Um, but the grants actually up and running, like, you know, participants in the programs is in July. So that'll be cool. Fun. And what I'll tell you, um, one, I have one thing I need to add still to the Google Drive folder, and then I'll share it with um, Kirsten and Tara, I guess, um, uh -huh. uh, that there is like a hot off the presses, I don't think has even been released to the public, but I have permission to share it with this group, is a interagency document um, that shows, that's for use by um, Chicago, Cook County, and Illinois state officials on that like shows the myriad of worker rights issues and has um, indication of where you should file a complaint. It's kind of like a, a, what would you call that? It's just like a resource guide, but it's like, I've never seen, <laughs> I've never seen government put something like this together that is like on so many different levels. And it's really, really, really exciting. Um, you know, I think that, that there's just been so much concern, um, especially with like now, obviously with some COVID um, issues that like where to go. Um, and so if anybody has questions about that, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to help out. The Illinois Attorney General's office has been like very proactive in investigating cases and 
um, and and really like sticking it to to unlawful employers, sticking it. That's what I'm sure that's how they describe it. <laughs> but I don't know. Sorry. Um, anyway, well, thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just going to take this last moment to do just kind of want to echo what Allison had mentioned earlier about the workers' rights curriculum. Um, this is a free resource that can be really advantageous for not only you, but also for your participants. And so I just encourage you to go over to cjc.net. You can find this underneath our frontline focus tools um, and you can request the curriculum there. It is completely free. And once you put in the request, you receive it almost immediately. And it's just such a really great way to incorporate this without having to you know, overhaul your curriculum. You literally can just pick and choose the activities like Allison mentioned earlier. So just really want to highlight that again, her team did a phenomenal job putting that together. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much everyone. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.